In the 1830s, London was plagued by gin, with its strongly intoxicating liquor getting the population drunk and disorderly. The government wanted to do something about it, so promoted beer as a healthy alternative, and loosened the licensing laws to make it easier to open a beer house. In Stoke-on-Trent, where the working people had never been able to afford gin, suddenly beer was freely available. And over the next 40 years, 98 new beer houses opened up in Longton, with almost every third house on Normacott Road putting a beer barrel in the front room and setting up shop. What used to be called then was selling out houses. They weren't pubs, but you could go in and buy beer or whatever you could bring out. I think they called off licenses now, aren't they? And it was always clear you couldn't drink half a pint of beer in all the pubs. If you went down one side and had half a pint of beer in each one, you wouldn't make it back up the other side. There are many instances in the potteries where you'll find next door to a pot bank or a manufactory a local public house. Uh, you'd have the scenario where the kiln men would send out for some jugs of ale from the public house and of course they'd send out the mould runners, their underlings, uh, to do this for them. So they'd come back and refresh themselves with ale from the pub because of course it was 30 work. Teams of potters were paid in £5 notes or sovereigns and had to go to the pubs to get change for their wages. Women would plead with their semi-sober husbands to return home while there were still some wages left. The little mild runners and other children workers aged seven upwards all had to wait in the public house, spend their due and await the favour of the the landlord. A little lad from Fenton was amongst the boys who stood around in the hope of receiving the poultry week's wage. His mother waited for the bit of money their lads had earned. The boys appeared with wages in hand. The lad gave his mother his half a crown and they started home. For a close member of American and the two women having a fight over this being, being the sister, <laughs> yeah, and playing the piano. We used to have a good sing song and that, you know. I, I was about 15 then, 16, and we used to go to the Queensbury Road Club and coming out, and it was about nine o'clock. We used to go in the pub, I used to have a, a couple of halves of shandy, and they didn't pay me, but I used to get it 50 fags or something like that for playing the piano. Nineteen sixty when I started working at Longton, if there was a call for us to go, come on Harold, you know, let's go. Out up Surrey, take the time, when get the adjusters they've got to get each other sorted out, says. <laughs> so that was it. We we sauntered along to the pub and by the time we got there everybody had gone home. <laughs> Mark the books up to say <laughs> everything quiet, everything in order. <laughs> There were things going on in the pubs, but it was usually handled pretty well by the licensees. In the 1850s, there was one landlord who owned the Pig and Whistle in Flint Street, Longton. He was called Brandrick, and reportedly he scattered hot coal around the customers' feet to scare them off if they were cheap customers not spending much. But as long as you had plenty of money to spare, you could probably drown your sorrows in peace. We had everything in there, skittles and everything, all the proper old game skittles, crib. We had a, a real proper uh, skittle board, which is quite rare, a lot of them are copies now, but all the, the uh, they used to work on a, a chain, you know, a small chain. We had darts, pool and a big pool team darts teams, it's that really good. We used to have a bit of a quiz league where you had a game, you drew against an opponent and you'd play a game of crib, a game of dominoes, 
a game of darts and then you'd go in through a quiz at the end of the, the evening. There was, there was gambling in all the pubs. We'd play a game called Maltese Cross, which is a, a Domino's game. And somebody would walk off with sometimes about £20, which was a lot of money. Because it dragged on and on, it normally involved a bit of a locking when the curtains were drawn and the doors were shut. And I've seen uh, Stoke City footballers going over walls through back gates in pubs, you know, on a Sunday after the, even after they played on a Saturday, to go in the pubs and have a drink, have a game of pool and a game of darts or a game of skettles and there, and they'd be let in early and then you'd have the lock-in on the Sunday afternoon. The, the general kick-off across the country was three o'clock. In other areas like Lancashire, their pub hours at the dinner time was, say, half past till half past two. We're in Stoke-on-Trent, the licensing hours were 11 till 3. So to allow people to get to the matches, both Stoke City and Port Vale used to kick their home matches off at quarter past 3. There was numerous, numerous pubs around both football clubs. We'd have a pub crawl if we were going to Stoke City. There was there many pubs in that area. The Whippet Racing Men of... You go down there, very likely you'll see anything from a dozen to, to 20 whippets there, dogs and bitches of a Sunday dinner time. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes uh, a fellow will bring one, perhaps for 15 or 20 mile away, and want to sell this whippet. And then you get together, and the fellow says, how much you want for it? Well, I want a tenner. Well, can I try it before I buy it? Oh, you'll try it. Well, what about trying it with the uh, Jenny? Bill's Jenny. And if her beats Bill's Jenny, I'll give her 10 quid for her. Right, I will go and try her. A keen delight in pigeon racing. It's a highly organised sport, followed with intense seriousness. It can draw a whole neighbourhood from their houses to watch their preparations for a big race. There's money at stake too, often hundreds of pounds. Ten seconds to go. Up. Then comes the wait in the evening light for the birds to come winging home over the terraces and chapels. What they wanted to do was implement a system whereby they could close a number of pubs that weren't being used or being improperly used. Someone from the brewery has gone around the pubs and frightened the licensees into selling the various pubs to the brewery rather than waiting for the local authority to put a compensation order in. The breweries would have had a lot more clout and had the, the local authority decided to close a pub, then they could have fought the battle a lot better than a single person. It was in the 1960s, the whole of Normacott Road in the 50s and 60s was being demolished. Loss of neighborhood, Loss of earnings, the licensee can't keep the premises going, can't, can't earn a living. The chances are it was closed down uh, really because of lack of use. And they were always trying to close pubs again because of the fact that there were too many in the area. It's a shame that so many of Longton's pubs have gone. Before the television, they were a place that people came together to share the news. We'll miss them, but we still have some great memories from the pubs that have moved with the times. 
and I hope we'll make many more memories over the coming years. Come on, Joe, sing one. Come on. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. What, me? Not tonight. He'll take that off. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. All right, then I'll sing you one. An old tramp was resting one day down a lane When a lot of young sportsmen came by They passed many Jones on his tattered old clothes And the tramp heard these words with a sigh What a scarecrow he looks, says some young fellow there Like a bundle of rags come untied The rest of them laughed at the joke of their friends and the tramp looked up and replied, You can't but a stop to misfortune, for what is to be will be. I might have been up in the world. 